Nice to see so many people here. Um, I'm very happy to see this and yeah, my name is Paul. Uh, I have a number of different roles, most of them related to industrial ecology. And here and this event is, is centered around and work with metabolism of cities. Um, and one of the goals that we have as an organization is to bring people um, insights and knowledge around urban metabolism. It's uh, for many people a new concept. And it was for all of us who started this, it was a new concept when we first started doing this. And we feel it's worth knowing about and exploring, but you often need some help doing that. It's not something you can find you know, uh, organizations for that, that do that in your neighborhood. So that's why we exist. And this presentation is going to be about an introduction to urban metabolism, so that those of you who don't know what this is about, get an idea and an understanding of what we're going to be talking about in the rest of the, the seminar. So, as Ara showed, the urban metabolism concept is an analogy that takes the idea of an organism and a city being similar. So, if you think of an organism, a cell or a plant or an animal, that organism will take inputs from the environment and it will do something with it. It will grow or transform or just sustain itself and there will be outputs. Well, if you think of a city, of course, there's a lot of similarities happening. There will be resources taken from the environment, the city will grow and change, and there are outputs. So that's where that analogy comes from. And that's what we use as a way to, to indicate that what we want to study and understand are the, the materials, the resources that go through a city and the impact it has on it. So the goal that we have is to understand resource use and disposal and extraction to better understand sustainability. But this angle of urban metabolism hasn't always been the same. So if you look at this concept, the same phrase, the same words have been used back in the day in many different disciplines. So you can see in social ecology, in human ecology, in urban ecology, um, many different disciplines use the same term and they mean different things with it. When we talk about urban metabolism, we will generally be talking today from an industrial ecology perspective. And that is one of the perspectives, but it also means that if you think, okay, I know what it means, and you meet someone else, they may actually have a different understanding of what that means. Now, let us just look at what we mean with urban metabolism. So, we use this analogy to think about resource flows through the city. Um, so, we have flows that are created by and interacted with by actors. So we're interested in the flows and we're interested in the actors. But all of that we do through a systems thinking perspective. So we're really keen on understanding the whole. There's been a lot of work done and in the past you've seen a lot of work that focuses on particular elements. And you can say let's think about carbon emissions in the city. Or let's think about water. And you find it has a use. But we feel the benefit of looking at the city as a whole outweighs the complexity that it brings. And you get a more holistic understanding and there's lots of interrelationships. So, let's talk more specifically about what it means if we talk about urban metabolism in the city. So first of all, you need to think of a city as a system in which we see things going in and things going out. So you have your inputs and outputs. And when we talk about those things, we talk about materials and energy in principle. So those are the, the things that a city uses, transforms, and then emits again. And in urban metabolism, we generally study a number of different flows. And because it's a, a systems thinking approach, we try to map everything. So you can think of water, energy, materials going in, and a number of other things going out of the city. And our goal, if you think of this, is to create a mass balancing exercise that fully maps everything. And that's one of the advantages of this approach. Energy, matter, cannot be destroyed. So if you take the whole city and you think every, everything that's going in, it needs to go somewhere. It cannot disappear. So either it goes out again, or it stays within the city. And that's a very useful benefit of this approach, because if you do any type of accounting, and you try to map your numbers, they need to balance. Just like a checkbook. 
So that's the benefit of using this approach. But it doesn't stay there. So we don't say, okay, let's look at inner time. The goal is to understand what happens within. So you have a society, you have an economy, you have a built environment. They will all interact with energy and with materials that are in the city. And we try to understand what happens between all these different actors and what are the connections. So there's lots of interrelationships between different types of materials, between different actors in society. You can't just say, I follow this from here to here and it's out. So let's take an example. Let's take an example in Cape Town. So if you look through an urban metabolism lens, and let us look at fossil fuels, particularly petroleum. So petroleum going in, into the city, how does it happen? It happens in principle in two different ways. Either by boat, it arrives at the port, it gets offloaded and it goes through a pipeline to the Chevron refinery, or it arrives in Soldana, then goes through a pipeline to the refinery in, in um, Chevron's refinery. So that's how petroleum gets brought into the city. What happens? Of course, a refinery will, will transform petroleum into a number of different products. So you get diesel, you get uh, petrol, you'll get products that, that lead to tar and to plastic. <coughs> So they have a number of things happening and that come out of the refinery that then find their way into the system, into our socio-economic system. A number of these products will be consumed within the city. So people will drive their cars, some of the, the diesel will go to the Ankerlift power plant that also sits within Cape Town. It will be transformed into electricity with emissions going out. Other products will actually stay in the city. So Tar, for instance, will be, become part of the built environment. And other parts, for instance, petrol and diesel, will be exported out of the city. If you go to a petrol station in Swellendam, it could very well be the petrol that's produced in Cape Town. So, if you look at the flows of this petroleum, it goes in a number of different directions. There's a number of diff different actors involved. The economy uses it in many different ways and it ends up in the environment or in the socio-economic system in a number of different forms. So if you take this urban metabolism approach, you don't just look at your CO2 emissions. No, if you say, let's look at urban metabolism, you look at that whole life cycle within the city. So, this field has been expanding significantly in the past decades. So this industrial ecology approach has been started a number of decades ago. And you can see by the number of studies done that there has been quite a strong growth in the last couple of years. And that, of course, has very much to do with the fact that cities are so much key in this sustainability challenge that we have. And also in um, the fact that we see that there is a great benefit of using this approach to try and understand sustainability. So, if you look at a map where are studies done, you can see that lots of it is done throughout the world, most of it in the Northern Hemisphere. So that's also something that creates an unbalanced understanding of cities. And of course, you can see all kinds of other fields are also less developed in the global south and the global north. And it's good that we're here. Now, if you think of this approach, how can this be used? How can, what can urban metabolism do, but from this industrial ecology perspective? Well, a number of things. Firstly, you can use this in monitoring of monitoring of urban resources, you can understand how they flow through the system. If you do any intervention, and you want to understand if your intervention is working, you need tools to monitor that. And of course, the system's perspective is very helpful because you could be manipulating something, it has an impact on the main thing you study, but something else is also being affected. So that makes it very helpful to use this kind of approach for a more holistic understanding. Here we have an example of Cape Town, material flows through Cape Town. So this is a material balance in 2013 in which you see how things flow through the city. And this is the kind of diagram, Sankey diagrams, that we use a lot to visually represent how physical flows move through a city. Here are some other examples. So you can think of urban metabolism as a, as a territorial study, what happens in the city. But you don't necessarily want to stop there. Because the impact of the city isn't limited to what happens in the city. What matters in the end is what is the impact of everything that we do outside of the city. The production of the goods that we consume has an impact. The disposal of our, our products may be outside of the city, but it's the impact we generate. 
So there are also other tools that you can use. And here's an example of what happens in the city, the urban metabolism numbers. And there you can see visually what's the impact that happens outside of it. And again, having these numbers helps a lot in understanding where we have to look and what really makes sense. And if you think, for instance, of water, you may very well be aware that the water we consume to shower and prepare food is a fraction of the water that we indirectly consume by, for instance, eating food. To just grow food takes much more water than what we use to, to cook it, for instance. And that's also something very important to take into consideration. Other things you can track over time. This is an example, I think, is of Paris and the energy being consumed in Paris and what materials are used for that. Um, a very hot topic at the moment is circular economy. But when you talk about circularity, you need to also understand, well, how are we going to measure this? And again, urban metabolism comes in as a useful tool to help track that circularity. And you can actually see if you look at what is the origins of your flows that come into your city that are being consumed, half of those origins are not from within your city or from within your country. And you can see, well, circularity would be very difficult to achieve if you bring in so many things from outside and you dispose of them outside as well. There's also a very um, geo-referenced component to our work because we really talk about a place, we talk about a city, and we also talk about in the city, where does something happen? So you can do a lot of mapping and understanding of the physical space and what places are important. And again, it's very relevant that we're here. This place is very important for solid waste and for our wastewater. And that has to get here somehow. And that transport and that the, the infrastructure that you need is very space specific, specific and getting that understanding and that information mapped out is incredibly helpful for a number of different things that you can do. Here you can also see how you can identify drivers and you can try and link what you find out with your urban metabolism work. You can try and link that <coughs> to other indicators and you can see, okay, how does density play a role? Does that impact different uh, uh, urban metabolism flows? Uh, is it income? Is it number of buildings? So doing these kind of mapping exercises can help you see relationships that otherwise may be difficult to understand. You may have heard of urban mining, which is the idea of taking materials that are embedded in the city, taking them out again. And that's incredibly relevant these days as resources are running out, and in any case it's often not the most sustainable to keep taking things from the environment if we already have it around. In order to understand how to do urban mining, you need to understand the stocks that are present in the city. And urban metabolism uses flows to understand the um, resources, but flows lead to stocks. Because the flow that goes in and doesn't go out right away creates a stock. So that the urban stock helps you understand what you can do in terms of urban mining. Now, um, if we look at sustainable resource management, this is an interesting graph. You may not be able to read it, but let me go through it. So, what in the end we would like to achieve as a society is strategy and decision making that helps create sustainable resource management practices. But you can't just do that. You need a solid foundation in order to take decisions. So what does that foundation need? Well, one layer down are indicators. You, you need to base your work on some indicators to help you, help inform your decision making. Understanding visualizations, it's, so if you also think of, of policy and practice, it's often not ideal to go through data tables and, and spreadsheets. So visualizations help a lot. One level down, understand the uncertainty. This is not a perfect field. And you need to try and limit your uncertainty to make sure that the things that you do are based on data information that is as good as possible. Modeling models and scenario building is part of what you do as well. Try and figure out what's the impact of taking something out here. What would be the impact of installing a new technology here? All of that, in the end, needs to be based on data. Data informs all those kind of models and creates information about uncertainty and that feeds into the, the upper levels. And in the end, you need to have systems to generate data. All of that is not easy. Let's just think about this whole story about petroleum. 
Well, you need someone who tracks information, a system that captures information about how the petroleum moves through the city. Sure, Chevron may keep, keep track of the petroleum that they buy. Do they share it or not? It's a different question. But then what happens if they sell their different products? Who keeps track of that? Who keeps track of how much fuel you put into your car? Or how much fuel is put into a power plant or local industry? So it gets very messy very quickly. So we need systems to capture data, then we have reliable data, and then we build up. So what we like, we work at the bottom end, part of this. We work on creating systems, on capturing data, creating visualizations, but we want to reach decision makers. We are no decision makers. We come from an academic background, and we've been playing around in this. And one of the reasons that you're here is to try and say, okay, we think you want to base your decisions on a a solid scientific underpinning, and that is sometimes it's difficult to do that. And we'd like to see, can we bridge that gap? And are there ways in which you can tell us, this is what we miss, or this is what this approach potentially could offer, or this is how it will not be beneficial. We need to have that conversation to try and also inform us as to what is the type of information that you need. So that's the goal of today, to try and see if we can improve this trend. So, these concepts of urban metabolism may be new to you. You may have heard of it, it may be something that's totally new. However, it may very well be that you've used an urban metabolism approach or thinking, but you just didn't call it that. And this, we see that a lot. So if you now think about what we talked about, what is urban metabolism, this systems thinking approach, taking, taking flows and understanding the actors. I'll show you an example. This same approach is done in this report, but they never called it that. This is a report by the city, uh, the Water Development Performance Plan, something like that. So they publish every year, and this report, it, mandated by national government, is that it includes a water balance. This water balance needs to describe exactly how the water supply comes into being, is used in the city, and goes out of it. So it describes all the quantities, it is a balance, it needs to balance. It describes where it's being used, which industries, and in the end it's a systems thinking approach to the whole cycle of water in the city. Nowhere in this document will it mention urban metabolism, but it's exactly the kind of thinking that we practice. And we have names for it and we have other tools that we use, and we know that other people use the same but just don't label it. And we'd also love to hear from people Maybe you've used this, you've never told it that. And we hope that we can bring some more understanding and some different tools and ideas to that same thing. Okay, that is a bit of an introduction of what urban metabolism is. I hope that made sense. Um, yeah, I'll hand over to Lauren to field any questions. Thank you.